Welcome back to the Blue Chip Academy Blueprints of Success interview series, providing unique blueprints, tactical knowledge, and best practices to navigate the critical points in the football ecosystem so athletes and parents can prepare a plan to a career path that any athlete can bank on. So today we have an amazing guest, nine-year NFL vet, Howard alum, now entrepreneur, owner of Cuzzle Chicken and Waffles and Con Cannabis, named the Cranes. Detroit 40 under 40. When we talk about using sports as a catalyst to career that you can bank on, our guest is a prime example of this and to maximize the process at every, at every level. Always giving me game. One of my mentors when I entered into the NFL as a, uh, in my vet in the DB room, man. Let's welcome Ron Bartell. Welcome What's in, up, man. Thank you. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Appreciate it. And no doubt, man. Just always wanted to uh, get you on the show, man. Like I said, somebody that coming into the NFL that you gave me a lot of game and a lot of um, – just gyms, just going through it, just being a professional and everything, just how you approach the game and just your story. It's, I mean, it's very, very detailed and very uh, unique. So we can talk about a little bit, especially, you know, coming from HBCUs. I mean, I can tell the story now, but like you were like the first person when I got to the Rams that I saw when I walked into the room. We had DB meetings. I remember walking into the room and I saw you. I was like, I don't know if this is the right room, man. <laughs> <laughs> if this is a corner, man, I don't know if this is the right spot. So we just talk about all that. It's like, man, he went to Howard, all that good stuff. So yeah, make it to the NFL from an HBCU. Not only did you have a hell of a career, but like, you know, everything that's going on with Dion, Eddie George, Hugh Jackson, everything going on in the HBCU scene. Which pi What's one piece of advice that you would give um, to a current HBCU player thinking or a player thinking about attending an HBCU? Um. To embrace it. Um, I mean, it's such a totally different landscape from when I was in school, what, oh man, 20 years ago now almost. Um, you know, the, 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 the access of in information has changed so much. If you have talent, they'll find you anywhere. So um, I would take it as a badge of honor to be able to go play at an HBCU and not look at it as a, a step down or um, inferior in any sort of sort shape of imagine. Uh, just um, embrace it, um, enjoy, enjoy the ride. Enjoy the, the culture um, and um, just um, just embrace the access and the status that uh, guys like Dion and Eddie George and um, even you, Jackson, what they're bringing to the, to the forefront right now. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great answer. And just like the second part of that, what about the players that are at an HBCU now wanting to play professionally? Um, be different. When I when I got to HBCU, when I got to Howard, um, it was uh, totally different than being at Central. Uh, Central was a, you know, it, it was uh, a meat factory. It was, you know, that's what college football was at the time. That's what it is, to be right. quite honest. Um, <laughs> so um, come, come, going to, to Howard, it, you're right. <laughs> going to Howard, it was a little bit more, um, a little bit more lax. But um, I felt like that gave me an advantage because I was coming from a larger program, and um, you know, the the level of uh, work that we were accustomed to was totally, di totally different than it was. I'm going to a smaller school. Um, but I think, um, you know, quite frankly, uh, it's, it's so many opportunities for guys right now, no matter where you're located at. Um, like I said previously, just just don't look at it as a as a uh, inferior place to be at. But I, quite frankly, Howard saved my life. Um, it, it helped me um, with my transition after football, all the, all the relationships I was able to make while being um, at Howard University and on top of the things that I gained from the football scene as well. That's on point, man. Because I always, I always, I talk to my friends about it a lot. Like you can tell, certain cats that come from HBCUs, like they definitely operate differently once they make it into the NFL. Like kind of the, the point that you're saying, whether it's, I don't know, I can't even say it's like a level of discipline, but like there's a level of shortness of like kind of what you're doing, right? Like you say, like whether it's a level of maturity or different things, like you said, where the experience is a little bit different than it is maybe at a PWI or a different type of school in that sense, right? So right, anyway, let's go. Yeah, yeah. So going back to recruiting process, going back to Detroit a little bit, Helen from Renaissance High, Michigan, three point uh, three star, three sport athlete. Let me tell me about your experience through the recruiting process. Um, looking back on it, man, I was so um, uh, misinformed <laughs> to what the recruiting <laughs> process was really like. Um, I didn't have, uh, you know, I didn't have like a um, at the time. Um, hot, I mean, uh, Renaissance was just. Uh, in its infancy of football. I think my first year playing football, there was the only third year of the program. So we didn't have this long lineage of guys coming out of school. But um, what we did have, um, the class two years older than me, um, they had a, a great football team. Um, and I was able to watch those guys 
and how the recruiting pro- process played off, out for them. So I just kind of picked their brain when it came to recruiting. And um, um, I wasn't the most uh, heavily recruited athlete at the time. Um, so my, my process was a little bit slower than you would have thought. Um, but, um, you know, I took the visits like everybody else. Uh, I was a big fan of the, the movie program. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so I thought, I thought recruiting was supposed to be like program or, um, you know, also a he got game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you blue chips, I mean? that whole, blue yeah. chips. So, you know, that's what I thought. That's what I thought recru- going to recruiting business uh, was supposed to be like. Um, but you know, I had the fun, but also, I t- also took the approach that, Hey, uh, let me find a place that, um, best suits, uh, what I want to do. Um, which was uh, pursue a professional football career. So I wish I had taken an approach of uh, actually looking at the, um, the amenities of the school, the, uh, the makeup of, of, of the, uh, the diversity. Um, you know, if I had uh, thought about that, I would have never went to a PWI um, initially. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm just um, knowledge is key when you're young and you don't have that experience. You don't have uh, people that can uh, give you that information. Um, you tend to make a little bit of a couple of mistakes. Um, but looking back on it, uh, I would have taken a totally different approach to recruiting. Well, man, that's key. And that's honest, because I mean, that's what we're trying to do here is close those gaps. Right. Give those codes after going through and we'll get to you where you're now. But like you've reached the pinnacle, right? Whether you say pinnacle, make it to the league, make it to your second contract in the league, transition out into entrepreneurship. But like your your path, obviously, you know what I mean? You had some codes to give back. So that's kind of, I mean, that's what we're doing here. So I, I love to love to hear that. So for you, like you said, it was like a, like a late process in the recruiting aspect. When did it start getting serious for you? It started getting serious uh, the summer going into my senior year. My junior year, um, I was playing out of position. I actually had me playing tight end on offense, which was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I didn't um, know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. They had me playing tight end. Tight end in the corner. Four. Man, I was six one, a buck ninety, playing tight end, and then playing safety on uh, defense. Okay. Uh, but that 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 summer, um, going from my junior to senior year, um, I went to all the camps, and I just I blew up at every camp. Uh, I went to the Michigan State camp. I was um, with the late great Charles Rogers. We were both co MVPs of that camp. Um, I went to Indiana University camp, blew up there. Went to the Michigan University of Michigan camp, uh, did great in the Smokehouse. If you're familiar with the Smokehouse, the 40 yard dash. Yep. Um, I just had a really strong summer. Um, I put in the work though. Um, I literally was waking up early in the morning, um, running from where I lived at at the time. I was running like a mile, two miles every morning, um, lifting extra, um, just doing a lot of field work. I put in a lot of work that I didn't see a lot of other guys doing. Um, you know, um, so I, I definitely put in the work that that brought. That, that uh, brought on the success I had over the summer. And once the summer was over, I, I was able to translate that to the football field, which was the real thing when we put the pads on. And I just had a really strong senior year. Um, led the team in interceptions, led the team in, in uh, receiving yards. I just had a really strong year. And um, from there, um, the crew process opened up for me. And you talked about blowing up at the camps. What exactly were you doing? Because I don't know if people know, like Bartel is a, a freaky athlete just from the measurable standpoint and a great football player. So, like, I mean, you're obviously you're big, like six two, like two ten, running fast, a low four three. Like, what were at, at the camps? Was it like on the field, different type of different stuff? You talked about the smoke uh, smoke show at Michigan. I won that when I was coming out of high school too. I remember that's like a that was a pretty cool yeah. thing having all the guys out there and, and racing. But like, how were you dominating at the camps? Man, I was um, uh, from a, from a physical physical standpoint. I you know I had all the measures. I was, I was even going into my senior year, I was six one, like a buck ninety because of the work okay. I put in in the weight room. Um, you know, so I had this height, weight, speed aspect, and I was just a really good athlete. Um, for instance, uh, the day after I finished at the Michigan State camp and won uh, co MVP of the camp, I was playing basketball the next day um, at Michigan State with my high school team. And um, I had like a tip dunk in, in the game and Coach Izzo spoke to me after the game and wanted me to come walk on. So I was just a really good all around athlete. And I, and I had a good work ethic. I really had a good work ethic between being blessed with the measurables and um, also having a good work ethic. I just took advantage of those opportunities. I definitely second that. You definitely worked in a, st- a student of the game, something that I, yeah, I mean, I always respected on the highest level, man, just the way you approached the game is a professional. I mean, we'll get to it later about this stuff. But like Bartel was somebody that gave me my first scorning of like, man, you better take care of your body. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pass on the joking. game that was given to me, man. Yeah, hundred percent. I always, always appreciate it. You mentioned it earlier, but you said you didn't feel um, too informed. Like, how how did you end up understanding like about the recruiting process or making your decision to go um, to Central Michigan? Um, I made I made my decision based off of. Um, you know, um, 
looking back on it, if I if I would have if, if if I had known the things that I know now, um, and just the world being more open and um, just you know at the time I wasn't heavily recruited, so when I went to the University of Michigan, I was on I was on a, a visit with guys like DJ Williams. DJ Williams was the number one player in a, in, um, in the country. So just knowing that I measured up to those guys, I wish I, if I had a different mindset that I was able to develop from just getting out there and competing, knowing I measured up to those guys, I probably would have went to the University of Michigan off top. So I went somewhere where I thought I could get on the field faster rather than taking on the challenge of going somewhere and just really challenging myself. Um, I wish I had taken on that challenge to go to the University of Michigan because I, I probably would have got drafted higher. So it all plays out to, on towards the back end of your career because once you get once you get in the midst of things and once you start competing, um, you see like man, I could hang, I could really do this. Like these guys, this guy may be a top player in the country, but he's not much better than me. You know, like I said, Charles, me and Charles Rogers were co MVPs. Ch- Charles Rogers was the number one player as well, number one wide receiver. Hell, he was the number two overall pick. We were co yeah. co MVPs. So you know, just constantly competing at the highest level with the, with the guys considered to be at the highest level. It opened up my mindset of, hey, I can really do this. Well, that's a, uh, I mean, that's true. That's a pretty humble brag saying that you get drafted higher because, like, just for context, he did get drafted in the second round. Was it 54th overall? So, what was it? 50th. 50th, 50th overall? My bad. I gave, him, I gave him four more spots, man. I don't want to get it twisted from, from Howard. So, like, yeah, he's definitely right. Probably would have got drafted, you know, top 20, top 15 and, and that aspect of that. But that's a great point that you talk about where it's just that level of understanding the development curve and – level of challenging yourself right where you said like you're coming out kind of a late bloomer and it's like all right i can go right. here and do that but it's like i want to get on the field and i want to play versus this is where i'm at and where i can be that's a that's a very interesting point when you were going to school did you have any idea you want, what you wanted to do after football uh quite frankly um football really wasn't my main focus going to school i always figured once i went like i said once you get in the midst of it and you start competing you see where you stack up yeah. The first day I got on campus and got on my first practice, I was like, at least I could be a, a, a free agent. Okay. Like, these, this is the guys they're talking about are supposed to be best. I, at least I could be a, few, a free agent. So, um, you know, I, I definitely um, going into school, my, my mindset was always business. Um, I grew up around a family full of uh, entrepreneurs. So um, business, uh, business administration was my, my number one thing, figuring out how, uh, what it takes to be an entrepreneur and get, getting those, um, getting that, um, that, that, um, getting the uh the education for one um being able to build my resume through school and then football as well so you know um being an entrepreneur was always number one even when i went to school Word. okay so that's what you were looking for were you looking for like okay you said that yeah business 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 administration yeah that, i mean that definitely makes sense that was like always your makeup so like what was your yeah. key takeaway um that you would share with anyone going through the recruiting process like now Take your time, man. Get gather all the information. Go on as many visits as you could possibly can. Um, you know, foot and, and the game is so different now because it's so much more different with the freedom of movement. You know, when we were making these decisions, these were decisions we were gonna have to be stuck with. Now guys are able to make, you know, decisions that's that's best for them at the time, which is fine because you're so young, what we think for us is best at that time is gonna constantly change. So make the decision best for you at that time, but make the make Make it with um, all cards on the table with all the information. Um, but like I said, it's so much better now because a guy can transfer and play the next year. You know, when we were coming out, it was, hey, if I transfer, I have to transfer down. Or if I transfer to a, a like like school in the same division, I'm I'm sitting out a year. And you even had to get a, a uh, you you even had to get permission from a coach to transfer back then. So we didn't have the power that these athletes have now. So with all that power, um, take advantage of it. You know, take advantage of the, of the system because the system damn sure will take advantage of you if you let it. Absolutely. You may, you mentioned it. it's like like taking accountability of gathering the information that you need to, right? Whether you make, because it's a business decision. So it's like taking advantage of this recruiting process, like an entry into like the business world in a sense of navigating your deals, your opportunities. Like what, like there's so many aspects to a university that you're going on. It's like, all right, the culture of the university, the power cities, like who's the coach? Like is the coach on the hot seat? Who's the offensive coordinator? Is he moving? He's going to be going. Who's the defense coordinator? What's the right. scheme they're playing? Like what's the, what's the depth chart? What's Get all that information. And, and all that information is readily available now. Exactly. We didn't have access to the information now. So you use these tools, these phones, Instagram, TikTok, use, you, use that information and, and use it to your advantage. Um, that's, I think that's why you see guys making these, business decisions when they go to school not because they have all the information it's easy to get in touch with a guy who came out the year before you could literally dm him and ask him about his experience 
Um, so, you know, just take advantage of all the tools and, and gather all the information. And even, even if you make a decision, end up changing your mind later, make the best decision for you at that time because right. things do change. For sure. hundred percent. That's great advice. So you're coming from a top high school program in Detroit. How was that transition to central Michigan? Um, it was, it was fairly easy for me. Um, okay. I, you know, um, like I said, my, my high school was pretty competitive. Um, once I got on campus and I saw what I was competing against, I, I, I got that inner confidence that I needed. Um, I really didn't think I should red shirt, but that red shirt year did help, help me in terms of lo- learning the lay of the scan, learning how to practice. That's the one thing that I did have to learn. I really had to learn how to practice, okay. um, take care of my body. So I really took advantage of that red shirt year. I, I went into central Michigan at about a buck 90, buck 95. After that red shirt year, I was 205, 208, you know, totally different body. Um, knew every you know it, it helped me become a man within that year and once i got on the field my true my, my red shirt freshman year i was a much better player than i would have been my my true freshman year and that's a good point that you talk about that red shirt year like you can make that right investment and really take off in your career or i've seen it mess up a lot of guys that go to the big schools like get red shirt and it's like those fridays oh we're out partying get in trouble <laughs> on the weekend, go one go two ways. And it's just like really turn up it's like career go over before you even start so that's a great point yeah. man when you get red shirted Take full advantage of it, man. You get a chance to jump on uh, some of the competition and really develop yourself. Like that's because yeah. that's something that's going away now, Ron B. When you talk about these guys now, because it's like most of them in school thirty six months. We're trying to get to the league in three years, and if yeah. you're there four, that five stars coming in, you got to transfer out because it's almost like right. that's and, getting to like basketball to an extent. Absolutely. And even looking back on my career, I'm like, man, I cost myself a year and earned it's red shirting a year. You know, because um, because thinking back on my career and my even my high school, my, my college careers, um, if I had the information that these guys have now, now is how quick can you get to the league? Mm-hmm. You know, I would have came out a year earlier, even if I'm a, a fourth or fifth round pick, because I'm going to get to free agency a year. Early. Mm-hmm. And that gives me another year in my career because your body's going to take the beating anyway, whether it's in college or the pros, you know, this. yeah, you, you're sore regardless. <laughs> So you might as well take you might as well take the beating when you're younger and recover faster, and, and it gives you an extra year to make that money. I'm a prime example of that, man. I left, you know, I left early, and I got when we, when I got there, I got drafted in the fourth round. And my my rookie year, I messed up my toe. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'll, sometimes yeah. I think, like, well, man, if I would have stayed in school, and I think, man, if I stayed in school and messed up my toe in school, right? Because I mean, like that did change the whole dynamic of just how I moved and everything. But like I was obviously in the league at that point, so it was like my red shirt year. That first year was like a scouting assistant slash, you know. The, the rookie, we get to all those, the rookie dudes right. and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was an interesting first year. But take advantage of that developmental piece to it. I think that's that's very, very important. So what was your, like, welcome to college moment where it was like, man, this is real life business? Oh, man. I um, It was the first scrimmage we had. Um, I made a tackle on the goal line. Great stuff. I stuffed the – Remember, I was playing safety at this time. Okay, yeah. So I had a whole different mindset. I came down here on stuff to do it at the goal line. And, man, I every extremity went numb. I was laying out <laughs> on the field on my back, just numb. And they didn't stop practice. They just moved it down the field. That literally just let me know, okay, th- what time, this is what time it is. This is this is a real deal. They really don't give a damn. They just blew the whistle and moved the, moved the, moved the drill like 20 yards down the field, and everything just kept going while I laid there. Wondering was I paralyzed or not? So you know that was my welcome to that was my welcome to college moment, man. It was you know it was brutal back in those days. That was like real two a day. I'm about to like, say that's we, that real. We were still on astroturf, bro. Oh, <laughs> when I got to college, had to, had to put the uh, tape on and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, you taking showers like hopscotch, going in and out the shower, trying not to get burnt. No, so, that's yeah. real. I mean, yeah, that's that's like real physical, right? Those two days where you're tackling the whole oh, time, yeah. and the whole I mean, those, time, both. That's both, your first both, stinger both action. Practice. Like your yes. first, yeah, it was so worse than this thing. I was like, I thought I was dying. That'll get you. And that'll make you feel like, man, I got to get in the weight room, dog. Like, that, like yeah. the first time that happened to me, I remember that I was first got to the trainers, like, you need to get in the weight room. I'm like, man, you know, like, that man, too. <laughs> <laughs> you tackle them then. You know what I'm saying? Right. You, got right. to say. <laughs> you, got, you got something you to say. You want to do this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trainers and all you guys man love y'all but uh yeah so what led to you to transfer what led to uh you to transfer to howard oh man it was a culmination of things i i really was like a fish out of water going to central michigan um you know i was detroit public school man like the only time i had been around white people at that, that time in my life was through sports you know okay. one or two guys i play aau with or you know 
having a white teacher here and there right. or the police. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I never had interactions. <laughs> well, let me just keep it real. I yeah. just never had interactions like that. My school was like 98% black. Detroit is a majority black city. So, you know, I just, you know, my neighborhood black. Um, so I had never just really been, you know, up north when you're dealing with, um, you're dealing with white people. I'd never been around black people as well. So it was just culture shock. man. Okay. And on top of the culture shock as from a young man from the inner city going to, uh, Central Michigan, you know, which is in West, you know, it's, it is like up in the middle of nowhere. So that culture shock on top of that, the football, man, we were just not good. We were like really bad, which is, it's, um, one thing to be a bad team. It's another thing to be a bad team. You're dealing with, uh, a head coach who just does not relate to the players, uh-huh. you know? So it was just one of those things where the culture just wasn't there. The football was bad. So it was my best interest to, you know, go somewhere else. Or Take my talent somewhere else, like LeBron. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I mean, at the time, it's probably not a, a, a typical place to go. But like, what made you land on Howard? Oh uh, man, I really was trying. To, I was trying to go to Michigan State. Okay. Um, I really was trying to go to Michigan State. I had a relationship with uh, Bobby Johnson, who was the head coach at the time at Michigan State. Couldn't get my release. Like I said, it was totally different back in those days. A coach yeah. could pretty much end your career if they wanted to. Um, so I couldn't get a release. Um, some of two of my best friends from high school um, were were at Howard. I had I had literally went to Howard the summer before I transferred. So I transferred in um, after the se- after the two thousand three season. Uh, the summer of two thousand three, I had went to DC um, just to hang out with my guys, and I was on campus that time. I'm like, man, this is this is different. It was that Chocolate City. The energy was different, right? <laughs> it was like it's like a recruiting trip. <laughs> You know, it was it was totally different than Central Michigan, man. Like, you know, it was it was Chocolate City, the, the you know, the, the women on campus, the, the guys just hanging out, you know, uh, rap music playing on campus. It was just like a totally different vibe, um, you know, and uh, just being out there for that weekend just really opened up my eyes to the HBCU experience. And, um, you know, just having to make the decision of not wanting to sit out a year, considering I had already red shirt, I didn't want to lose a year eligibility. You know, I just decided to, um, you know, transfer somewhere where I knew I was going to be comfortable socially. Uh, I knew the the academics were second to none. Um, You know, the football wasn't the same, but as long as the academics and socially I was fine, um, it was just the right move. And I I, I wasn't going to have to sit out of here. So it just worked. It worked out great. That makes makes a lot of sense now that you explain it that way or how you how you got there. I mean, and you said you're basing it on like the education and the social the social climate. It's like, all right, I'm gonna take care of myself on the football field. Like that's that's having like true confidence in your abilities, right? Because you get there. I mean, it wasn't just like a, a factory where guys are just getting drafted, you know, from how. Right. But you got you and AB or Theo. You guys came out from playing uh playing there and making that major splash in the NFL, right? Like being the odds by. I mean, we'll talk about that, but. So yeah, you, and, and, and go ahead. No, no, sorry. finish up. Go ahead. And um, yeah, and I knew, I, like I said, I'm coming from Central. I, you know, I had already competed against the best, so I, I already knew why I stacked up talent wise. I, I played against Charles Rogers at Michigan State. I was going against uh, Darius Watts, who was, you know, a second round pick as a wide receiver for Marshall. Byron Leftwich at Marshall. Um, you had um, Michael Turner at Northern Illinois. You had Big Ben at. Miami. So the Mac was like really, really good back. In, you know, Chester Taylor at, yeah. at Toledo. I mean, the list goes on and on and on against yeah. the guy. And I was competing. I wasn't just competing. I was like at the top level with these guys. I was dominant. I was having really good showing against these guys. So I already knew from a standpoint, like, look, I'm, I'm clearly talented. If, if I could go to the uh, uh, HBCU and, and, you know, dominate, I'll be fine. They'll find me some way, somehow. Um, so that was my mindset. Like I said, once I, I get in the situation, I, I'm able to measure up myself against everybody. Like, oh, okay, I could do this easily. It makes perfect sense. Like that, that definitely makes perfect sense, especially like the outcome. I mean, that you did have is like built perfectly for you. So then, right, when you, it worked out. The cards worked out right. Right. When you got to Howard, did you notice any critical advantages attending Howard over Central Michigan? Like, why you? Were, uh, yeah. Just peace of mind, man. Peace Quite of mind. honestly, just being in a new environment, um, having that stress off of, uh, you know just going to a place that I really wanted to go to class every day. I, right. you know, I had no issue with actually showing up to go to class. And that was um, purely the PWI HBCU culture. You, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was totally different. It was just a totally different culture for me. So just socially having that peace of mind, being in a place where, you know, um, for instance, my, my first game at uh, central Michigan, we were playing, uh, we had a, uh, we we're playing a ESPN game. It was a night game. It was open to season. I, I want to say it was against Eastern Kentucky. 
I got arrested the same day as my first college football game. Right? Right. <laughs> like, yeah, man. Like, that would never happen to me at Howard. Right. You know, I got arrested on campus. On campus, the same day I was supposed to play my first college football game. For dang. I'm dead ass serious. Well, so that that you know, that those were the type of experiences I would have. I literally got arrested. I was in front of the student union. Um I got a, a D D W B in front of the student union. Wow. Um, I had just cashed my pail check. They they had four dogs and came and smelled my car and found my my my, uh, my money I cashed my pail check and thought I was up there selling drugs and locked me up. Oh. I got bailed out three hours before the game. That was my type of that was the type of experience I was having at Central Michigan. So talk, that would never happen to me. At so when we talk about cultural differences at schools, like these are the type of things that can happen. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I knew, I knew something happened. I didn't know that was the actual story. Of, like they just rolled up day day of the game. Day of the game. This is my first college football game, man. My red shirt freshman year. And so how they this, like so my, you're so let's go into that a little bit. So you get arrested and like who do you call? You call a coach? My, I called uh, Harold Goodwin. T- was that a teammate or a coach? A, that was coach. He's a, actually he's an assistant head coach with the Buccaneers. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, he was my he was my he was my recruiting coordinator. He was in Detroit. He was over the Detroit area. All right. Um, he recruited me and he was the offensive line coach at uh, Central Michigan at the time. And they got me out. But that was the type of stuff that guys were experiencing in Mount Pleasant. Ah. You know, coming from the inner city, it just was not the environment for a young black man, especially me. I mean, that's a, uh, that's so, incredibly honest. I mean, that's true because just knowing yourself that's and like the type of those, things we have to think about. Yeah, because that's a part of the, your decisions. whole college experience. Like you're in the football Definitely. one part, but then there's another thing that you got to deal with the students that you're around, and like that is your nucleus of your network that you that we're going to talk about. Like when you transition out of the game, that kind of go back to them and be like, all right, where's the connecting pieces to? you know, using the sports as a catalyst into my next career, whatever the thing may be, entrepreneur, executive, all that good stuff. What was the most uh, memorable part of your college experience? Oh, man, um, just the, the, the relationships, quite honestly. Um, I wasn't fortunate enough to go to a big school and play in huge games. Um, you know, uh, the biggest games I played were in was the Howard Hampton homecoming. <laughs> Me and Howard Hampton uh, rival when we played a homecoming game. So if you want to talk about in terms of uh, – those types of things, games that 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 those types of games were memorable to me. But just the relationships I I created, I still talk to some of my guys that I went to school with at Central Michigan. I'm very close to with my guys from Howard University. We always find time to get back together. Uh, me, AB, a few of the other guys we played with. So just those relationships, I'll talk to those guys for the next 20 years of my life. So the bond that we've been able to uh, keep for these year, all these years, is the biggest. Best experience I've had going to either Central or Howard. I would definitely agree with that, man. That residual effect of like that nucleus, right? It's so important that you're in the right space to be able to take full advantage of these different ecosystems that you fall your, find yourself in, playing a sport or not playing a sport. So, like now we talk about you know being a successful entrepreneur. Like, what do you be, what would have been your NIL strategy? Like, if you were in college? Oh man, I wish <laughs> I wish <laughs> NIL was available. Um, <laughs> I'm not not knowing all the particulars about NIL. Um, I mean, I, I just think it's, um, it's 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 even in the playing field for guys to make decisions best best for them yeah. uh, be, to be able to capitalize and, and, and monetize off your name, image, and likeness. I mean, who wouldn't want that? If you put in the work and somebody's able, was going to pay you to, to to promote something, um, you should be able to receive the benefit from that. Um, so I'm all for it. Um, I love to see the chaos going on with the NC2A. Um, I, I absolutely love it. It's never been an evil, even feel for all the schools. You know, the same 2025 20, schools are and not, not even that many. The same maybe five to seven schools are competing for national championship every year anyway. So um, I, I love to see guys getting paid. I, I play with a lot of guys who could have made a lot of money just off of NIL through college and career path. They maybe not made it to the NFL or maybe they made it only play of the year. So just to be able to see guys be able to monetize um, and, and make some of this money, especially with the money coaches are making now. You know, I'm all for it. I love the chaos it's caused. No, that's, that's, that's real. Because like when you think about you guys being at HBCUs, I, I'm just interested in how, I mean, it, it's a different, it's a different vibe. Like how would you think you guys would have capitalized on, 
you know, name, image, and likeness. We thought you would host at parties, try to do the merch thing. Parties, man. Like, I don't know yeah, what you yeah. guys would have been doing to Howard. Like, yeah, but it would have been, been hard. Like, that's, like, there's a cool opportunity. You know, I mean, that's opportunity when you're talking about name, image, and likeness. It's a level yeah. of, you know, true, authentic, like, brand association. And when the thing at these, these PWIs sometimes is, like, the fans, they know you as a football player. Like, at an HBCU, mm-hmm. you're talking about the social aspect where, like, you could get some real cool stuff off of the sport and yeah. it's like fits in naturally with like just the social climate where it's like very yep. authentic to what you are doing. I mean, you see Ralph Lauren, they're doing the HBCU capsule collection with Morehouse and all the different stuff because they understand, you know, like what it is. But and yeah, it, absolutely. So just being able to benefit off that, I'm, I'm sure we, we, we would have come up with something clever, but um, I'm, I'm interested to see what, how, this, how far this thing goes and uh, particularly how it affects uh, Black colleges. Um, I love seeing what Dion is doing. I see he has the young, the young fella, uh, Travis. I can't remember his, his last name. Uh, I think he has a couple of NIL deals. So yeah. you know, it, it even the, it, it could level the playing field to a, a little bit for HBCU if if you if you talk about group 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 economics and and, and um, these black brands and these people and these brands that cater to black brands, uh, black people. Um, you know, be able to make it where we could get track the top talent to these schools. That's very true. And help with the infrastructure as well. And you just getting that whole yeah. ecosystem around it where there's things in place and just it, it just keeps stacking up like that. That's a great point. So we talk about the transition to the NFL. You go ahead, get drafted by the Rams in the second round, 50th overall. Is that where you were expecting to get drafted? Especially coming from HBCU? Um, or are you not thinking about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I pretty much knew um, after – Senior Bowl, um, how I performed at the Senior Bowl, and um, how I, how I did well, how I did at the combine. I knew I was going to go second, maybe third round. But there were some talks about me falling, being able to sneak up to the late first round. So I knew I was going to go late first, early third. So I was pretty comfortable. I was pretty comfortable that that draft day. You know, that was back when day one was long. Right. You had the first three, I think, first three or four rounds of the draft. So it was a long day. But I I knew after day I was going, I'd be good day one. Okay, so what was like when you get to St. Louis at the time? What was your welcome to the NFL moment? Oh man, um, Stephen Jackson <laughs> 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 trying to tackle him. Man. <laughs> that's real. That's that's yeah, that's real, man. He was he's what he man. did. Like I said, I saw you first like going to the meeting room, but see, like people don't talk about Jack enough. It's just like one of those nah, like, freaky enough, athletes. I wish he played in this new NFL, man. It's, it's, it'd, be, it'd be killing, man. 6'3", 240. Like, yeah, 6'3", 240, running, can you wiggle, you know, take off? Wiggle, <laughs> run, run away from you. He was, a, he, was a, he was a great one. So, yeah, Steve gave me my first uh, welcome to the NFL moment, man. Him and Clinton Porter. Clinton Porter's got me pretty good my rookie year and ran through me some snot came, came on my nose. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that's real i mean was, i mean clint Porter, he got me i got him i was coming on the bliss and i remember i probably remember we was, he was sitting there like some guys get ready to do something I'm like man he's just sitting there i just read it like chin me up, oh. like, the whole <laughs> stuff up. Like, I yeah. split all over my joint man that's real so like when you're in the nfl though like I always admired how you handle yourself just in a in a in a business manner right whether it's dealing with the coaches whether it's dealing with your off field um, business, how you approach the game in terms of studying, how you take care of your body. Like, where did that all of that come from? Um, I guess the molding of that. Oh man, um, you know the, the vets, the vets. Um, having Corey Chavis around was a huge, huge uh, role in my development. Um, you know, the guys I had my rookie year: Demetrius Butler, um, Travis Fisher, um, Dewan Gross. Um, Marshall Falk, Tory Hope, Orlando Pace, Isaac Bruce, just seeing how they move um, and seeing the success they had. So being in that locker room at the time with all those older guys, you know, I came into an old league. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you know, I, w- I came into the league at 22, 23, but I was still considered young. Now you got guys coming in at 20, 21, uh, you know, so, um, you know, it's not a vet now. It's probably like 28. Yeah, straight <laughs> so up. Back then we had guys like, and they mid thirties still playing. That's going to be pl- that was playing for years. So um, I came in the locker room with Leonard Little, um, uh, Leroy, Leroy Glover. I came in with so many just professionals. You had no choice but to walk a certain way and act a certain way, or you weren't going to stick around. That's true, man. You talk about the culture just coming into like a league, whether it's going into college or going into a league. I always appreciate it. You know, you uh, Chavis and just like OJ and just the vets there and like how it was because, like you said, there's like limits of. 
I cast more wow. Like, you guys like looking at you like, all right, you're taking this is a business approach. Like Chave, like he had his way of doing things. You had your way of doing things. OJ had your way, his way of doing things, but everybody was like disciplined, organized, and kind of was focused on their purpose, even outside of football. Like you guys all had right. your thing outside of football and was actively kind of doing it while we played. You know what I mean? I always was like, how do I, how do you do that? How do you like focus on this and do the other business um, opportunities? When you were playing in the NFL and working up to like your second contract, you had like that crazy, was that, that your fourth year? When you just knocked that. Oh, my, uh, yeah, my, yeah, my, my, yeah, my, my, my fourth year, my third year was, was pretty crazy, but my fourth year was just like, it's when it all started coming together. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Cause a lot of people, when we talk about getting to the NFL and you know, the, the goal changes immediately. Like all right, the goal is to get to the NFL. And then as soon as you get there, it's like, well, shit, I got to stay here. Right. So now it's like, I got to get to my yeah. second contract. And you, I, I got there when you were hitting it on all, all the cores in uh, that third or fourth year, like third and fourth year. Um, can you take me through a little bit of that when the game started slowing down in the NFL and just everything lining up the second contract playing on the field, Man, you know, business you, and everything, you know, you know, you know, one thing about, the league and you know this it's 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 a it's a game of circumstances right it's kind of where you draft there's it's only so many guys there's a, a a small percentage of guys no matter what situation they, they they're in they'll have success right you, you may have like 10 guys in the league no matter where they go they'll be successful quarterbacks included mm-hmm. um so you have to be in the right situation so when i got to the rams um we were in transition so you know, um, I was a second round rookie, but I didn't get treated like a second round rookie. Like I really had to earn it. I, I didn't dress the first six games of the year. Oh, wow. um, started the started the last eight games of the year. And then we had a coaching staff change. And, you know, when the coaching staff change, you know, you get lost in the shuffle. So my second year, um, they had drafted Ty Hill and I became like an afterthought um, until, you know, we had some injuries. And I, I just finished strong my second year and just went on a, a tear the last uh Five or six games of my second year, I had like four interceptions, like a touchdown. I, I just finished on a really good tear, and I just carried that momentum from that 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 second that stretch of my second half of my second year, and just really just kept building and stacking on that um, from the off season workouts. My off season workouts got uh, more diligent, got more fine tuned each year. Uh, my diet got better every year. My film study got better every year. So I just kept putting in the work and stacking, you know, one um, percent every day and. Um, by the time I get rolled into my third year, the game had just significantly slowed down. And that fourth year, I felt like everything was all together. Personally, off the field wise, everything was coming together. Professionally, on the field, it was coming together. Uh, spiritually, um, the things I was doing, uh, everything was in alignment. So I felt you. So I, and I, it, it showed on the field. I just, you know, we were terrible as a team, but my level of play was just like extremely high. No matter you know what the outcome of the game was, and, and the reason was because I just made sure everything was in alignment. Within my professional life, my spirit, spiritual, my, my body, everything I was doing was geared towards the goal of, yo, I'm going to leave it all on the field and whatever happened at the end of the season, it'll happen and hopefully leads to a, a, a pretty good payday. So I just had supreme focus. Focus and alignment, man. That is like that is the key. And it's a lot harder than you would think because, I mean, he's not talking about as much, but <clears throat> I always admire your study habits, right? Like we talk about being in camp and not realizing like, yo, where's Bartell? And you go see him. He's like, oh, he's watching film. You know what I mean? Because everything yeah. will be operating how it, how, it, how it was or whatever the case may be. And just sometimes seeing, like, the different preparation, like, you, whether it's how you take care of your body, bringing in different masseuses and bringing them to the group. Like, hey, we got this masseuse coming in. Got to take care of your body. So as you're putting all these pieces together and lining different things up, would you say that the culture, like you said, the vets that you came into kind of helped put those pieces in place that you just kind of oh, taking them in? I was taking a little bit from everybody. Yeah. I was taking a little bit from everybody. I was still in um, Isaac Bruce practice habits. Um, um, Corey, um, uh, the way he took care of his body and study habits. So I, I was uh, OJ, you know, some of the things he was doing. I was finding what worked for me and what I could steal from everybody. Because we're all different, right? Yep. What you have to, the way you study film, how much film you have to watch could be totally different from mine. But um, there's something that you do that I could find that could work for me. And I try to implement it in everything that I did. And like I said, it, it, it just and it's very rare that that happens because I don't think any other year of my career um, happened like that. I think 2010 was pretty close. I had 2010. I think I had a pretty damn good season. Uh, but 2008, I, I just felt like when I go back and look at that film, I was 
I was pretty dominant. Yeah, yeah he was, yeah, I that, think that, I don't remember too many. Straightening guys down and making plays on the ball and, you know, big hits. I was having sacks. I was, and then, you know, like I said um, earlier, you know, um, circumstances. Um, playing for a guy who's using you properly, 2008, you know, we had Jim Haslett. Yep. Jim Haslett was ahead of his time in terms of, you know, using a lot of nickel and dime packages and some of the blitzes, razor, the split razor, schemes razor. that he was using. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, not looking back on it, you know, I, you know he was um, – you know, he 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 was he fits today's game because he tried to get his best athletes on the field. Let me get my best eleven on the field, and I'll put them in the best position to make plays. And he allowed me to do that instead of lining me up on one side of the field and saying, "Go cover this guy." He moved me around like a chess piece from the slot to linebacker to safety, some looks corner a lot of times, and I just I was just able to be a football player and make plays. That's a great point, man. I always thought has like you said, he was ahead of his time. Just when I got there, and he was drawing the blitzes on the board and how he was doing, it and just like. It didn't always work. It, it, it always worked. But, like, the, the thought process of where it was coming from, it was like, right, right. oh, because, like, in order to do it, you had to have the best people on the field because he was asking, yeah. he asked for some wild stuff. Some wild stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good, though. I mean, you got, I mean, stepped up. I mean, that's why they pay you the big bucks, that pay yeah. everybody in the league the big bucks, man. That's awesome. So, playing a nine year a dream career, what are the keys to beating all the odds and having a career like that? Oh man, uh, focus, um, luck. You gotta have a lot of luck. Um, attention to detail, um, being diligent about your body. I mean, you only have so many hits in this body. You only so many times you can hit the ground and pop back up. It's only so many tackles you can make before something pops. I mean, only so many times you can teach that before you roll something or something tears. So just having, you know, just taking advantage of knowing that this lifestyle is, is not forever. And um, taking advantage of every single moment, every second, and getting squeezing every juice out of that out of that orange or that lime, or however you want to want to term it, um, just getting everything you can out of a career because this is so short and it goes about goes about so fast. But as you know, it can be very rewarding. It's about, I mean, especially now the way the game has grown, um, the things that they've done to to to, to give guys longevity, um, the 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 access we have to the information so we can make better business decisions. Um, so I think these guys have a great advantage and I'm just, I'm just happy to see the game keep pushing forward and guys keep getting money, man. I love seeing guys get paid. Absolutely, man. Using sports as a catalyst to a career as you can bang on, because we all know like the percentage of what you can get from, from sports is one thing, but like transitioning out different relationships that you can build, the connections that you can make. And like, you have a critical view going through the complete sports ecosystem in general, whether you want to get into scouting, coaching, or be an executive in different brand uh, activations, be an entrepreneur, understanding how different things operate. Like you're coming up through a billion dollar business since you're, 13 years old, if you kind of understand the tentacles that you're going through, starting with the recruiting process, right? Like evaluating all these things. We'll get into this next part about the transition, but as an entrepreneur and building businesses and things of that nature, you take, you're making informed decisions and going along with your gut and, and like rolling with it. So like right now we're just going to do a quick read. One second. This episode is brought to you by LIG Sports Group, which is an executive sports consulting and networking group where we handle the critical points of the elite sports ecosystem, starting with Blue Chip Academy at the high school level, and then we have specialty sourcing at the executive level. And in college, we deal with NIL properties and creating brands and, uh, under college properties. Um, we'll have the link below. You guys can check these uh, different services out. And like I said, we're here at the Blue Chip Academy. If you guys have any questions, whether it's deal details and the recruiting process, NIL structure and all those good things, um, a link will be below. Back into it. So, yeah, man. So we talk about the transition and going to your post-football entrepreneurial journey. One word to describe the transition. Oh man, it was uh, uh, physically it was jarring. It was very that was the hardest part for me physically. Um, can you take me through? Can you uh, expand expound on that a little bit? Take me through why it was physically jarring. I, I found that first year, the first year of retirement, I found myself every Sunday just getting sore for no reason. Like I played a football game because you know your body has so much muscle memory through the practices, through the games, through the training, the conditioning, and once it comes fall, you're, you're, your body's used to certain things. And once you don't have those things anymore, my body was like just going through withdrawals. It was like cold turkey. It was very weird because I wouldn't have played a game, but I'd, I'd be sore like I played a game. It was just, it was crazy for me um, physically. But um, uh, socially, financially, of course, financially, you have to make the adjustment because you're going from making 
um, tons of money to, you know, hopefully if you transition properly, you have things set up, you make a good money. Um, so, um, just, um, it wasn't the toughest transition because I never found, I never identified, I never found my identity in just playing football, you know, coming from, and I think it's an advantage I had, um, coming from a smaller high school program, not being heavily recruited, going, coming from a small school at HBCU. I never just was Rob Bartell, the football player. Cause you know, I didn't go to these big programs and didn't have all this pub and hype around, uh, around me. So I never really just uh, embraced it and just being a football player. I always knew that football is an option for me and I'm going to keep using it as long as it keeps going, but I'm planning for other things. So I was always a businessman. I, I looked at myself as a businessman since the day I got offered a college scholarship. So I, I was an entrepreneur since then. So for me, I had already started this journey of doing things in real estate and other business ventures while I was playing. So the transition for me was, was uh, easier. Um, I like to think it was easier the most, but um, still had its challenges. Yeah, hundred percent. So can you talk about a little bit? <clears throat> we always talk about being so focused on your sport when you're doing things and like not being uh, having your your focus going other places because you're trying to stay in that one percent. How did you manage building businesses while you were still playing, getting ready for that transition? Because again, that's something that I always saw and was like, okay, how, how do you do that? Yeah, you know I mean. Um, I mean, because I mean, we got 24 hours a day, but how much time of that day can we actually spend? doing football related things, right? Like how much time, like seriously, like, you you know, and I, and I felt like I had a really good work resume, a really good off season resume, um, really good in season resume. Um, you know, so I'm working out three, four hours out of the day. I'm getting body work another two or three hours out of the day. That's six hours. It's still 18 hours out of the day. I may sleep six hours out of the day. That still leaves me 12 hours out of the day. I was never a video game guy. So I was never like hanging out with the guys just playing video games and, so I was always spending that extra time uh, doing business related things. Those are the things that intrigued me. So I was always um, looking at real estate deals. I was, you know, I grew up, my father did real estate. So that's something that inherently I was, you know, it came natural for me as I grew up around it. Um, so, you know, uh, you have some guys that, you know, they're going to spend every hour on football. I was just not one of those guys. I'm going to spend a lot of time on football, but I do recognize my life isn't just football. It's a lot of hours out of the day that I need to do other things uh, with my life. And I still could be committed to the game to get things, the things done that I needed to. That's a great point, man. Cause you said you always had that business uh, mentality on things, whether it was like the different points in the game, whether how guys are taking care of their body, whether you're, how you're maneuvering or just talking about in the social climate, whether we're just at lunch or doing different things and talking about different business ideas. I remember you talked about right. FedEx trucks this one time or this, it was like, that was what you always brought to the table. And I always, always respected and always listened and like soaked up the game. And so I was like, all right, man, what's wrong with me? What's he going through next? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> because it was like, it's not for everybody. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. Like, but that's, it's very, it's interesting to hear. Like, you know, I didn't know like your, like your family, like was, were entrepreneurs and different things of that nature and, and like kind of where some of the base may come from. Right. Or just being able to right. cultivate that coming from an HBCU where it's like, all right, I'm not so focused on football. Like there's other parts to me. So like, leaning into those and having those muscles built what, up is like, right. But, but a delicate balance because I always, football was always number one. Period. I, so I always knew where my bread was buttered. Exactly. But, uh, you know, um, I always knew where the bread was buttered. Right. But, um, just realizing finding what worked for me, especially in the off during the off season and in season, what worked for my study habits, what worked work for me to take care of my body. Uh, once I was able to figure those things out and fine tune it and then have the infrastructure, right. Because I'm doing these business deals, but I've built an infrastructure that people don't see that I'm not the only one um, taking care of all these things in the back end. So, and you see guys moving like that now. You see a LeBron James with a Maverick Carter and the guys he's in power. You see a lot of these guys that carry themselves as a, as an enterprise because they are because the sports world has blown up. The business is so big now. I was fortunate to have a, a, a few people in my life that uh, played that role for me at the time. So. Um, it made it a lot easier for me. I don't. I don't think I could have done it without having that infrastructure and the team around me to to allow me to to uh, vet these deals properly. I mean, I think it goes to the same point of like it's like a it's a double edged sword in a positive way because like you take that sent those same principles when you're working on a business and you look and you're like you immerse it with the business stuff because a lot of the game used to give me was like look this is why this is a business look you spend this on tennis shoes you spend this on whatever habits you got going on you know what I'm saying but like you got to take care of this for. Uh, you know, the massage or the, or the therapy. Cause like, if you took care of a car, right. like, how would you do this? Da, 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 da. And just like ma bringing everything into the game from a business standpoint, not just like, Oh, you're in a, 
in a business or selling tickets, but like, this is where your business is, right? Like even how right. you viewed it. Cause like it goes to how you prepare for the, for the game. Like it wasn't an extracurricular. I mean, obviously it's a business, but having those different structures within the sport to be able to do multiple things and focus on this, focus on business and be efficient and I mean, successful at all the different, at right. all the different um, avenues. So like we talk about using sports as a catalyst to a career that you can bank on and, I mean, you're somebody, again, that I always admire in how you approach yourself, telling your story about different pieces is very, very cool to hear. So, like, did you have a sense when it was over, like when football was over? Because you see some guys, like, when it's you get cut and, like, they keep fighting to make the next next thing where you kind of like, all right, like, that's it. After yeah, injuries? I, I, yeah, I mean, of course, in, injuries played a – I mean, injuries did play a role uh, in my career ending, um, you know, having that neck injury and then coming back a little year. Bit? What happened? So, yeah, so, um, as you know, so, um, what was it? It was 2011, first game of the year. Um, we played in Philly. Um, went to shed – we were getting our ass kicked at the time, too. And I, I made a bad business decision, <laughs> <laughs> which is crazy because when – because, you know, you got some – you know, it was a shed play. I was I was shedding a tackle, and Ronnie Brown was coming around the corner. And I'm like, man, do I really want to throw my body in here? <laughs> so, you know, it was one of those types of things. Like, do I really need to do this right now? But, you know, you don't want to look bad on tape, and, you you, you, you know, you never never want to put out bad films. So as soon as I shed the receiver and go in and make a tackle, I get ear hold by the lineman. And my body was going one way and my neck was going the opposite way. Mm-hmm. A long story short, ended up fracturing um, two two uh, bones in my neck, actually three, um, done for the year. Um, the next year, I worked all hard that offseason, was in the neck brace. Um, you know, they didn't know if I was going to play again because they were saying I may have had, had to have surgery. Um, luckily, everything healed properly, didn't have to have surgery. Boom. The next year, very first game of the year, I'm going to make a tackle on Antonio Gates. Um, and I get ear hole in my uh, scapula by a teammate. Um, and I end up fracturing my scapula, split my scapula in half. So, you know, I, I was uh, basically missed half the season that year. So I was 30 at the time. So being at 30 years old, coming off two major injuries, um, you know, I end up signing with Detroit um, after I left Oakland. Um, played, uh, played pretty well in Detroit. But um, that offseason, uh, you know, they made a decision to cut me. And I went, I went for one, one tryout. I went down to Miami and they asked me to run a 40. That's when I knew it was up. That's, a- <laughs> <laughs> That's why I knew it was, I, knew it was I was 31. <laughs> you know, I was coming off two injuries. They asked me to run 40s and talking to me about special teams. I said, oh, it's over. Oh, that pit is real. <laughs> I got, right, you know, the pit yeah, when you go to Tuesdays, go working out, try to get back yeah, in. You guys. I, was, I was one of the Tuesday guys. I was like, man, I'm not doing this, man. I'm 31. You know, I can't do it. And I, and I put so much in- energy, you know, coming off that, in- that neck injury. I put a lot of energy uh, getting back on the field that next year. And so that next year, the, you know, for the very first game, it's a similar situation to happen again. And I rehab again and I get to Detroit and I'm, I'm, I'm in Detroit and I'm, I, I'm doing very well and I should make the roster and they make a decision to cut me for financial reasons. You know, you, you know how it is. It's, bi- it's business. It really is. They have to pick up your pension. They have to pick up your health, your, your health care, all those things. So you may have a cap number of 1 million, but, all these other things, what they'll have to pay out is more exactly. than that. Exactly. So, um, so you know, they make these decisions, and um, so they made the decision to get rid of me. And they were they were going to bring me back after, um, you know, after the third week or whatever. So I wouldn't, so I wouldn't be vet. So they wouldn't, my contract wouldn't be guaranteed. I wouldn't do that. And then I went for one work. I literally went to one workout in Miami. They asked me to run a forty. I told them no. <laughs> they asked me about special teams. I told them no. And I got on the phone with my agent and told him I was done. That's it. And I just. That's it. You know, I wasn't going to be one of those guys. You know, I, you know, this was year nine. I, you know, I wasn't going to be one of those guys just running around, going from team to team, trying to stick in, stick on. You know, I put in a solid eight, nine years. I was, I was content. I was content. You know, I wasn't happy because, of course, you never want to go out with injuries. But, you know, I was content where I was at in my career. I was content where I was at uh, financially. Um, you know, I had things going on off the field that I could attend to. So it was a fairly easy decision for me, That's, especially when they asked me about special teams. <laughs> that's solid, man. It's very, like <laughs> you could like walk away from the game, but that goes, that's credit to yourself. When you structure everything to that point, you get the year eight and nine. It's like, all right, I don't have to do yeah, this. Right. Yeah. Cause like, see yeah. where guys chase it. I mean, when I was at the XFL, it's like a whole nother gambit of a league amount of guys that are still trying to go. And, you know, some guys it's like, man, you need to go ahead and just, Go take that 
that job, bro. Like the same. Yeah, and, same. yeah, and I, and I, and I don't want to knock anybody for you know. I, I don't knock anybody it's, for making that decision. But for me, you know, I have family to think about, um, business to think about, and you know, at, at that point, you know, I was getting, I was going to get the veteran minimum. What, you know, the money I was able to make off the field during that time. What, you know, it wasn't the same as the veteran minimums. But hell, I'm not putting my body through the same. It's not. You know, I'm not taking those. Hundred percent. It's not a knock on anybody, right? Because it's a, it's a level of the passion and the identity where I think where people attach to the game. I think you said it earlier, like oh, yeah. you didn't really identify like that. So it was kind of like, all right, that's no. not the this, that's not the business move. But when you identify with it, no. guys are like. Well, I'm not. I don't know what I'm doing after this. So it's like I gotta keep going after that. And in that purgatory or that rigor mortis period where you're like working out, you know, guys' funds yeah. are going down. It's like losing where it is. Like that, there's gap yeah, in resume. Yeah, you lose money paying to work out. Paying right. to work out. It's, so that it, transition it, it, it gets is, harder man. and harder and harder. But just so hearing somebody that successfully went through the transition, there was things that yeah, you made the decision to be like, all right, I'm good. But you had certain things set up because of yeah. infrastructure and work that you put into that point. So just trying to put all the pieces together for where some guys go left or some guys go right. And it's not always that simple. Like sometimes it is emotional, no. right? Like where it's like, oh, I'm, I can still do it. I can still do it. And you know, that we see yeah. different stories. <laughs> but you know when you can. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you turn on the film. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. But that's me. Yeah, man. So we get into the current. So now owner, founder, of Cuz of Chicken and Waffles and Con Cannabis. So what inspired you to get into the food and cannabis industry? I guess uh, the, uh, the question answers itself. Oh, <laughs> man, the food, man. I, and I actually I actually just opened a new restaurant last month with, with some partners of mine um, called Petty Cash. That's um that's doing pretty that's doing very Petty well. Cash. Um, Congratulations, man. I always I told Cash. you Thank guys you. always up bringing a new business to the table. It's still <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, so but but for me um I it was the real estate, man. Everything, every deal I get into is it has some a real estate place somewhere in the background. So, um, quite honestly, I had bought a property in a commercial district in the city. Um, was looking for tenants. Um, you know, this was at a time where there wasn't any development going on in Detroit, especially neighborhood development. So this was, you know, uh, 2011, 12 ish. Um, was looking for tenants, couldn't find anybody that you know. Um, outside of a barbershop beauty salon and the area didn't need that. So I was doing that. But at the same time, I was negotiating a uh, franchisee deal with Wingstop. Okay. I wanted to be a franchisee for Wingstop. And when negotiating the deal, I just didn't like the terms of the deal. <clears throat> I felt like, you know, they had all this power, all this control. And so, you know, I was like, you know what the hell with it? I'll just come up with my own concept. I already own the real estate. Let me just come up with my own concept and, you know, see what happens. So end up partnering with my cousin. We had the same vision. Um, we had, we put it together and um, uh, we thought, you know, we thought it would do OK. Um, and it's been like a monster ever since. <laughs> it's, it's been a lot to handle. But we've, we've done well. The first year we did two and a half million out the gate. Uh, we've been doing pretty good sales ever since then. Eight years in um, outside of, you know, the things we've dealt with, uh, you know, with COVID. This has been a, a, a really good business for us. Um, we've employed a lot of people. I take a lot of pride, pride, pride in that. Um, we've helped spark. Um, development in the area if you come to the area now as opposed to what it used to like eight years ago that we played a huge role in that um as well um so yeah man it's something i'm proud of it's not the easiest business in the world but um i'm i'm i'm, I'm loving it um and it's something that i'll probably continue to do as long as we keep making money awesome man literally buying the block back i love that man so and then con cannabis how's like tell me a little bit about that Oh man, so uh, yeah, so um, in the cannabis space in in, in Michigan and Detroit, uh, which is crazy, you know, cannabis is like this next to uh, restaurants. I think cannabis might be the worst business to get into right now. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it is um, it is a school, tough business, school, man. School, so school much. Us a little bit. Why is that? Oh, uh, regular, you know, the regulations, um, the regulations, the, the, the regulations you have to deal with on the federal level, uh, with it still being illegal federally, um, the state. Um, state regulations is legal, but then you have different municipalities. So, for instance, in Detroit, we're, we're legal for medical, but recreation hasn't passed yet. But then the surrounding areas of Detroit all have recreational. So it, it, it poses a problem for all the Detroit operators because everybody's going to the surrounding areas because they don't have to have a license or a med card. So we're dealing with that issue. But, um, you know, it's something that I think um, as a black man that, you know, uh, um, I think it's important for us to have uh, representation. 
Um, so me and my partners are trying to make sure we 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 do um, have representation in this space. Um, we've been locked up for it for so long. We've been demonized for it, ostracized for it, um, and it's not a lot of us participating in this in this uh, this new business. And um, you know, it's it's something that 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 um, is um, medicine for one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of guys being able to use cannabis as a way to to heal and deal with uh, all the anxiety and pressures that we we dealt with when we played. And the, the hits on your body, so um, that that was a big thing for me to to get into it. And then, like I said, I just think representation matters. Uh, man, you got so many industries popping up between tech and all the different things going on in the world, and um, you know we have to have a, a better do a better job of making sure we're represented. I mean, that's a that's a great answer, and that's so true, man. Taking taking ownership and kind of going after, it, even from the standpoint of being at the table at a, a, a wing stop, and it's like, well, I'm not really feeling this, right? Like. Yeah. Being sharpened with different things in the NFL, whether it's like, all right, this is how I'm going to talk to a coach. Like just that partnership mentality and going at it with that that business look on it. So just kind of get into your process a little bit. How do you know when you're ready to jump into another business? Um, for one, do I have the infrastructure? For one, am I passionate about the first and foremost? Am I, if it's something do I want to do and I'm passionate about, or is it just to make money? If it's just to make money, of course people like to make money, but all money is a good money. So I don't think I'm at a point where I need to chase a dollar. Um, so it's something I have to be passionate about. Um, uh, I have to have the infrastructure around me, um, you know, because I'm in a lot of different things. I have to have people that I trust that can help me scale these operations properly. And it allows me to do what I'm good at, which is vet deals, uh, put the team together, put the processes and structure together and um, put the put the 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 the, um, the triggers in place so that things operate properly and keep it moving. I don't you know, so. As long as those things are in alignment, I, I can, you know, I'm ready for any deal for the most part. If if I'm passionate about it, it's a good deal. And I feel we can be successful and I have a team around me to make it successful. Have that team. The team matched up with the dream, like you said, the passion. That's Those are very critical points. Um, so what type of players do you think should follow that entrepreneurial path? Any traits that you bank on? What type of player? Uh, From a personality you know, standpoint. Got, uh Independent. I mean, people who are independent, man, you know, once you once you get in a, a certain type of lifestyle, do you really want to listen to somebody <laughs> when it comes to how you make your money? <laughs> you know, if you want to have somebody to answer to, um, are you OK with um, having to, uh, you know, eat what you kill? You know, if, you, if you're not OK with that, then entrepreneurship is not for you. Are you OK with um, working 24 seven? You know, because this is it's, there is no cutting my cell phone off is always something going on. Somebody always needs to get in contact with me about something. And are you okay with the way you live your life, knowing the way you live your life, your finances, everything you do can directly affect people. I, I mean, between my businesses, I employ over a hundred people. Wow. I, I directly affect over a hundred people, how I move and how I operate. If I do things a certain way, it, it, there's a ramifications. It's just not for me. It's a trickle down effect for my partners and, and for, um, any, any um, of our employees. Um, so, you know, I, I move that way. Um, you know, I've seen it at the highest level. If you, you know, like we talked about earlier, being in the NFL, I mean, what what business in America is, is more profitable and more sustainable than the NFL outside of, you know, gasoline or something, that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, natural commodities? The NFL is kind of ironclad. We saw that with a pandemic. Yep. <laughs> you know, a pandemic couldn't stop the NFL for the most part. Um, and it's only grown. So, being around, um, you know, um, billionaires and seeing how they've scaled their businesses, seeing how they structured it, and it's, it's so corporate. We get the corporate setting right up front and personal, close and personal. Um, so I was able to see that, um, learn from that, and going to, to the different teams, seeing the differences in their model and how they modeled their businesses, and how they set up the front office, how they treated the staff, how they treated everybody in the building. Um, that's something that I took away from the league and something that I value to this day. So if guys aren't ready to have that mindset where everything is on you, I don't, I don't suggest entrepreneurship for you. Man, I'm, I'm so happy you said that, man, just from the standpoint of like just paying attention to that critical view, like you're in a billion dollar business and looking at the different tentacles, whether you're being at, whether it's St. Louis and <clears throat> being there while Stan Kroenke is about to purchase the team. Like, all right, what's right. the team doing at this moment? All right, they're cutting money on the food. They're moving us here. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Doing this. When, you look, when you look at it, you, you start yeah, looking you at see, those you different the, things. You get like some you real, see, look at those it's things. like real critical view. Like it's a billion dollar business. If you like pay attention yeah. and like you get this critical, 
Advantage. You see how they, you see a team if they're selling if they're selling the team out of what what they what what moves they're making while the team for sale. There's certain team, there's certain moves that a team will make if it's for sale that they might not make if they're not for sale and vice versa. So you know we've been through it, you know, and just seeing it from a bird's eye view and, and up close and personal, and uh, you know you you're able to like you said get a critical advantage. And I said like cast man bank it in and just knowing what to look for when you're going through, you can get that upper hand when you're transitioning out. So like for active players and athletes in college and professional ranks is there anything they can do while still playing if they want to be an entrepreneur now i mean it's cool with the nil stuff but like what would you suggest like Man, from an infrastructure um, standpoint? find a find, find a mentor number one find a mentor find a mentor whether it's in a locker room whether you take a summer and you intern somewhere whether you have somebody look up to that owns a small business you you know we all have friends and families that may own small businesses find you a mentor and really just latch in and latch onto your mentor and ask those questions and, 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 you know, get out of your comfort zone. Um, like I said, it's such a different world now with, with the phone and IG, TikTok and all these things, like really get out of your comfort zone and, and, um, and put yourselves in uncomfortable situations and, and, and around people that you normally wouldn't hang around, quite frankly, open up, open up your Rolodex, you know, open up your, um, your, your avenues of, uh, of, um, you know, of people that you normally deal with. And uh, if you do that, man, you'll get all the answers you need. Find a mentor and get out of your comfort zone, man. Those are some gems right there. So we get to the end of this thing, man. What's your career end goal? You've done so much. Like, what's kind of the mountaintop or Mount Everest that you want to climb? Uh, I'm really passionate about the things I'm doing uh, in the development space um, in Detroit. Um, that's where I want my legacy to be is, you know, helping um, revitalize the city, especially the neighborhoods. These are neighborhoods that I grew up in that I'm very fond of that, you know, the streets that I ran as a kid. So that's my that's my passion. Um, um, outside of that, man, you know, just living life, um, enjoying the fruits of my labor, watching the kids grow at some point, being able to retire and hopefully pass this off to one of my sons. Um, hopefully they could take it and um, continue the, the family legacy that I'm trying to establish. Man, that's amazing, man. Thank you so much for joining the Blueprint to Success interview series. And like Ron uh, Bartel is saying, let's go back, you know, get out of your comfort zone and find a mentor if you want to get into this entrepreneur game. And like when you're going through this recruiting process, make sure that you're making informed decisions and take all the critical advantage from being able to deal with coaches, deal with administration, whether you're making uh, critical views, take advantage of the NIL when transitioning to the NFL, if you ever get to that point, understanding that there's this infrastructure that needs to be set up for you to be able to transition the way Bartel talks about and just having different things. And a lot of times it is luck and circumstantial um, depending on how things operate. But if you can take control of your path and being trustworthy and confident in your journey, I mean, things can work out. So Using sports as a catalyst and understanding with a business mindset. This was a master class on it, so I appreciate it so much, Bartel. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah, man. So appreciate it always, man. Always, man. If you guys have any questions, like and subscribe to the video, download the recruiting checklist, and we have the football and recruiting biz up master class. You guys get a comprehensive view of the recruiting ecosystem and all the different things and how it uh, attaches to the sports business so you can get in the captain seat and have an acceleration plan through this sports ecosystem thanks again man have a good one everyone i appreciate you boss take it easy